I appreciate everybody being here this morning, sticking around to hear, hear me. Go ahead and get my notes. This whole thing's full of notes, by the way. No, I'm just kidding. Get my timer set up so I don't go forever. It's kind of a little bit different setup than what I'm used to. Y'all bear with me. All right, so here we're looking at Proverbs chapter 7 about really this strange woman, right? We see this, this, this young man being warned of just this strange, you know, harlot, adulterous woman, basically, right? And, you know, we want to be warned of the strange woman. You know, we don't, as men or whatever, or even as ladies, we don't want to be associated or be friends or, or we get mixed up with the wrong type of woman, right? Because look at all the dangers that are here. I mean, the strongest men are slain by her. You know, you think about Samson, he was slain by the, the strongest man in the whole world, basically, right? And probably throughout history, or perhaps, right? And he was, his downfall was what? A woman. Think about Solomon, right? His, you know, the, the, the wisest man in the world, with all the power and riches he had, his downfall was what? Women. Outlandish women that, that right, led his heart away. So we want to be warned of the strange woman, so this is directed towards men, but you know what? We also want to avoid, you know, being the strange woman, you know, obviously as a lady, right? You know, and as, a, as men, we want to, you know, have our daughters or our wives, you know, avoid this. We don't want our daughters or our wives to become, you know, a strange woman, right? Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, let's look at verse uh, number one there, where it says, My son... Keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live, and my law is the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the table of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. So the key to avoid the strange woman is basically says, Say unto wisdom. So he's basically personifying wisdom as if it was a person here and call understanding, as if it was a person personifying that also, as a woman says, hey, as, as thy kinswoman, that they, wisdom and understanding, may keep thee from the strange woman. Because the key to, to, to stay away from the strange woman is to have the wisdom and understanding. Okay? And also the key to not become the strange woman is to have wisdom and understanding. So to, today, this morning, I'm going to try to hopefully give you some wisdom and understanding of how to avoid becoming or in uh, this strange woman. Okay, well, how does one, you know, become a strange woman? You know, does, is it just something that happens overnight? Well, no. If you think about any time you become anything, it's a, it's a process, I would, I would say. It's a growth or something, something involved there. You know, you know I, I like to think about, you know, or compare it to the fool that's also described in, in Proverbs. Okay? So there's all these different attributes or descriptions of a fool. And if you do this, then you're a fool. You know, or a fool does this. Right? So you basically read through these different things, say, okay, done that, never done that, never done that, done that. And the more things you have in common with a fool, the more that makes you a fool. Right? The less you have in common with the things of a fool and what a fool does, the less, you, the less of a fool you are. Right? That's common sense. But there becomes a, there's a point in time when you cross a line, though, and you're doing enough foolish things to now you've just become a fool. Like you're, you're, you're just, that's who you're identified with, where you are just the fool, right? You know, I've done, you know, people have done foolish things. Everyone has done something foolish. The thought of foolishness is sin. Everybody has a foolish thought at least, right? But is everyone considered a fool though, right? No. But if you do enough things that a foolish person does, then you are going to be a fool. You are going to be considered, kind of enter that new category. And I think the strange woman is the same thing. So, you know, we can look at the different attributes of a whore or the strange woman, and the more things you're like, yeah, I'm doing that, I'm doing that, I'm doing that. Well, it's like at some point in time, you just cross the line, and now you are the strange woman. So we're going to look at different attributes of a whore, and that's the title of the sermon, Attributes of a Whore. It's not going to be a conclusive list of all the attributes of a whore. We're just going to focus on the ones that, that I notice here, or that stick out to me in this chapter, what we can learn, because there's some interesting descriptions given of this, of this woman, and we want to avoid these attributes. We don't want to have these 
attributes in ourselves as women or as men. We don't want to see these things showing up in our women, whether it be our wives or daughters or whoever. We want to try to teach against this. Okay? You know, what, why? What's the danger? You know, because, you know, the Bible talks about the land falling to whoredom. If you'd like, you can turn to Leviticus chapter 19. And you might think, well, you're just picking on women. You just, you don't like women. You know, this is, this is a sermon that's geared to help women, you know, and men. You know, and, and more responsibility goes toward the men for this sermon. So you might think this is just a sermon against men, or this is just a sermon against women. The men can kind of just sit back and like, yeah, no. This is against men more than it's against women. Because every woman that's guilty of any of these things we're going to go through, they're only guilty of it because some man has allowed it to happen. Because every woman has a man that is responsible for them. Okay, In Leviticus 19, verse 29, it says, Leviticus 19, 29, Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom, and the land become full of wickedness. I mean, that kind of sounds like the land we live in, if you ask me. I mean, it, it, you look everywhere you go, just pick something, whether it be the news or the, the, the politicians or whatever's on the TV, or you go out wherever you shop, and you're just whoredom everywhere. Facebook, whatever, you know, whoredom abounds in our land, okay? And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that, you know, fathers have been prostituting their daughters out to whoredom. And but they've allowed their daughters to exhibit these different attributes of a whore that they could have learned about in Proverbs, they could learn about in God's Word, and they could avoid it. So you know what? No, the whore's doing this. My daughter's not doing that. Amen. Right? Okay, so we're going to look at this, and hopefully, you know, we can learn something from here. We can self, you know, safeguard ourselves from these things. And you say, well, I, you know, I'm not prostituting my daughter up, so this doesn't apply to me at all. I'm not prostituting my wife up or whatever. Okay, well, if she's not for sale, but do you have a for sale sign up? Okay, because, you know, a lot of times you might not be prostituting your daughter out, but yet you're advertising her. Okay, so, you know, let's, let's, let's have what we intend to do actually be what we are doing, if that makes sense. Okay, so we're going to look at some things here. Kind of jumped around on my notes a little bit there. Okay. So, look at verse 6. The purpose of this sermon, go back to Proverbs. We're going to be going in Proverbs, looking at Proverbs chapter 7 throughout the whole sermon. If you want to just keep a bookmark in that chapter, I'm going to be flipping with y'all this entire time too. The purpose of this sermon is to identify attributes of a whore and to avoid them, either in ourselves or in the ones we love. Okay? And we're going to learn these things from Proverbs chapter 7 here. And look at verse 6 where we left off. For at the window of my house I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding. So this guy, the guy who's basically the narrator here is describing, you know, he looked out his window, he's looking you know, downtown somewhere, wherever he's at, and he sees this man just that's an idiot. He's void of understanding. And what's this idiot gonna do, right? Let's see. He was passing through, verse 8, the street near, yeah, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. By the way, it's good to be at home when it's the twilight in the evening. You know, when, when, it's, when it's nighttime, I know we've been staying up late every night here. You know, it's okay when it's a church camp meeting. But in general, it's usually just a good idea just to be home when it's dark. You know, obviously, it's, I'm not saying there's anything sinful about that in itself, but, you know, a lot, of a lot of wicked things happen at nighttime. You know, men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. So when it gets dark out, that's usually when the whores come out, that's usually when the idiots come out, and they're just wandering about their corner. Okay? Verse 10, And what happened when he was there? And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. You know, I think it's interesting here. It doesn't say that this woman is a harlot. It just says she has the attire of an harlot. She's just dressed like a harlot. She has the clothes of a harlot. She just looks like one. Doesn't even necessarily mean that she is. So, well, I'm not a harlot. 
Yeah, but do you look like one? Are you dressed like one? Well, my daughter's not a harlot. Well, does she look like one? Is she dressed like one? Because God is basically the one saying this. You know, this is God's word right here. He's the one looking down. So you know what? This woman has got the attire of an harlot. You know, I would hate for God to think that about me or God to think that about, you know, any of the women that I care about, you know, or am responsible over. You know, that's a shame. You know, what, well, what is, what is the attire of an harlot? So how can we avoid that? You know, what, what, is that, what does that look like? What does a harlot wear? You know, and I was thinking about, what do you see a harlot wear in the Bible? And, there, and I don't really think the Bible really uh, just describes, okay, here's a harlot, here's what she's wearing, this is what we need to avoid. But I did, I did think of the example with Judah and Tamar. I don't know if you're familiar with the story with Judah and Tamar. You know, basically Tamar, well, let's go ahead and go there. Genesis chapter 38. Because she basically, Tamar is wearing something. She plays the whore, she plays the harlot, and she basically wears something that identifies her uh, to Judah as being a harlot. But let's see, is this what Proverbs is talking about? Let's look at this. Genesis chapter 38, and we're going to look at verse 11. It says, Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house, till Shelah, my son, be grown. For he said, Lest peradventure he die also, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. So basically, if you know the story, this is kind of a famous passage in my mind, uh, just because, you know, it's got Onan, you know. and you know, So basically, Tamar married Ur. He was wicked. God killed him. She married Onan. He was wicked, basically. God killed him. So now she's left a widow. And there's only one more son that Judah has. And he's not quite old enough. But he's saying, hey, when he gets old enough, Tamar, you can marry him. Right? Uh, so that's basically where we are in the story, just in case you weren't aware. And so she's supposed to remain at her father's house as a widow. And I'm going to bring that up later. So just kind of take a mental note of that. She's dwelling in her father's house. In process of time, verse 12... The daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died, and Judah was comforted and went up unto his sheep shears to Timnath, he and his friend Herath the Adolamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And notice this, And she put her widow's garment off from her. So she had a, she had a garment that was identifying her as, as a widow. Because she was a widow, her husbands had died, so she was wearing a garment to show that she was a widow. And, but she took that off, and she's going to put something else on, which is interesting here. What did she put on? It said, and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is, by the way, to Timnath, for she saw that Sheila was grown, and she was not given unto him to wife. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be an harlot, because she had covered her face. So... She took off the widow's garment, she put on a veil and wrapped her face. And then, this was to basically play the harlot. She saw, okay, his wife's dead, I'm not getting my husband. So she basically comes up with this horrible scheme to trick him, basically. She lies in an open place to make it look like she's a prostitute, because she's not at her father's house, right? She lies and waited at every corner, we'll get to that later. But... And then he see, Judah sees her. She, he doesn't know who she is. How does he know that... What, what makes him think that she is a harlot? Because it says, When Judah saw her, he thought her to be an harlot. Why? Because she had covered her face. So is this what Proverbs is talking about? Is this, you know, you know the, the, the attire of a harlot that we're supposed to avoid? A veil? That's, you know, I don't think so. And, the reason, and there's a couple of reasons why. Because... There are other women that wear a veil in the Bible in this same like culture that we're going to see here in a minute that also wore a veil, and it was for the fact that they were just about to meet their husband. Rebecca, she wore, she, you know, when she was about to meet Isaac in Genesis, let's go ahead and turn back a couple of pages to Genesis chapter 24. We're going to see Rebecca right before she's about to meet her husband Isaac for the first time. You know, she puts on a veil. Is this because she's trying to play the harlot? Is she trying to put on the entire harlot? Is, that, is, she, is she wearing the entire harlot in this story? No. It doesn't say anything like that at all. What's the reason why she's doing it? Let's read and see if we can figure it out. Genesis 24, verse 61. And Rebekah arose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man. And the, and the servant took Rebekah and went his way. 
And Isaac came from the way of the well Leharoi, for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. So she knew, okay, this is the, this is the guy that I'm going to marry. Because she never met Isaac. This is kind of like, the, it's the first time she's ever seen him. She's like, who is this? Is this, is this him? Is this, you know, oh yeah, this is my master's son here. So she covers herself up. Okay, keep reading. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife. And he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So is she, is she playing a harlot? Is she wearing a, the attire of a harlot here? Is that what's going on? No, she, she, sees, she sees the guy she's never met. She's about to marry. She's shy. She's nervous. She's got shamefacedness, basically. And she's like, oh, man, you know, I don't want him to see me. Maybe, you know, I don't look the way I want to look, you know. What, you know how women are. They want to look perfect, right, all the time, let alone when they're meeting the, the, you know, their husband for the first time, right? So is she trying to be a harlot or a prostitute? You know, no, she's, she's actually the opposite. She's actually the, the, the most honored, in the most honored position here because she's about to be married. Okay, she's about to be a wife, okay? So this veil, this covering the face in of itself is not just some, okay, this is the attire of heart. This is what's talking about in Proverbs. How do we know that for sure in Proverbs chapter 7? Go to Proverbs chapter 7. How do we know that this woman, the attire she was wearing, wasn't a veil covering her face? Well, look what it says in, uh, in verse 13. This is what she did. So she caught him, this woman with the attire of her heart, caught him and kissed him. So if she's wearing a veil covering her face, how is she kissing him? If she's got her whole face covered, because that's the attire of a harlot. So bottom line, I don't want to beat a dead horse because this is not really, j just to clarify, this is not what the attire of a harlot is. Well, what is the attire of a harlot? Okay, we figured all that out, but what is the attire of a harlot? Well, what is, the, what is the goal of a harlot? So we don't have a Bible verse you know, necessarily defining what that attire is, and it's definitely not a veil, you know, Okay, well, what is it? Well, let's think about well, what's, what are the goals of a harlot? What's a harlot trying to do? She's trying to sell herself. She's trying to give her services, right? And so what is she going to do to try to, you know, to do that? She's going to advertise herself. You know, she's selling her body. So you advertise what you're selling. You advertise your body. How do you do that? You show it. Light bulb, right? I mean, it's not that difficult to find, you know, to figure that out, I don't think. So, okay, well... You know, you advertise your body. Well, well what is a woman going to do to advertise her body that's different than any other woman? Well, she's going to show her nakedness. You know, that's what you're, you're going to do. Okay, well, what, what, is, what is nakedness? You know, different cultures, different times, they might think, well, if you show your, your ankles, that's your naked. That's how, you know, that's our harlot dress. Or if you show, you know, your, your thigh, or, you know, that's your nakedness. Or if, oh, if you show, you know, you can show your thigh, but as long as you don't show your butt or something, you know, then you're, you know, you're not showing your nakedness or whatever. But what is the, where does the Bible draw the line? What's God looking at here? Because he's the one that's saying this woman has the entire heart. What is he referring to? What line does he draw? Go ahead and turn in your Bible to, chapter, uh, to Isaiah chapter 47. If a harlot is using her body to make money and she's advertising her, herself... She's going to show her nakedness. And, it, and what, is the, what is the nakedness that she is going to be showing? What is nakedness? Well, Isaiah 47, look at verse 1. It says, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground, there is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldees. For thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal, uncover thy locks, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers, thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. So here, he's actually preaching against a nation, 
of, of Babylon, okay? And he's likening and comparing this nation of Babylon to a woman that is basically this woman who's living a life of luxury because Babylon was basically just this great world power and they were living it up. They had everything going for them. You know, that was the golden head that was going to be greater than all the other empires that were going to follow them. But this was going to change. They're going to be judged of God for their sin. So he's using their judgment and how their situation is going to change and, and comparing that with this woman who's living this life of luxury. She's sitting on a throne. Now she's no longer being going to, she's not, she's no longer going to be called tender and delicate. She's not going to basically just be living this life of luxury, doing nothing all day, just being pampered or whatever. Now she's actually going to have to start doing something, working, struggling, because it says, you're not going to be called tender and delicate. And he says, take the millstones and grind meal. So when you're tender and delicate, you're not having to work, basically. But when you now you're going to have to start grinding meal. You're going to have to start making your own bread. You're going to have to start working, doing something. You're not just going to be living as royalty now. You're going to be doing something that maybe a servant would have done for you in the past. Okay, He's all, She's also going to be doing other things that she wouldn't have done in the past. It says, uncover thy locks. Make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers. So it's basically referred to how now, if she's going to cross a river, she's going to have to walk over it. She's not going to ride a horse or a carriage or whatever she did in the past. She's going to have to do something that might not be considered what, a, what royalty would do or whatever the life of luxury would do. You know, she's going to have to walk over it. And when she walks over, she's going to have to lift up her skirt so her skirt doesn't get dressed or her, dre or her dress doesn't get wet. And she's going to make bare the leg when she does that. Because she's lifting up her skirt. She's making bare the leg. And what, what does it say she's doing when she does that? It says, she's make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers. And then it says, thy nakedness shall be uncovered. So what is, what is the Bible telling us? Well, it's telling us that when you uncover the thigh, you're, you're uncovering your nakedness. So guess what? Thigh equal nakedness. Okay, what's your thigh? Does anyone not know what a thigh is? I know what a thigh is. You know, your thigh is this region. Is this all of nakedness? No, there's other things that the Bible talks about as nakedness. Go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 28. You know, also notice what it said there. It says that when you, cover, when you uncover your nakedness, your shame is going to be seen. Because guess what? When your nakedness is showing, it's a shame. And you know what? You ought to be ashamed. It ought to be uncomfortable for you to show your nakedness. Yeah. And why preach this sermon? You know what? Because it's summertime. That's why. And summertime, all the clothes come off, and you got all these double standards everywhere you go. And, oh, we're going to go to church. We're all going to wear something. We're going to go to the grocery store. We're all going to wear a, a certain amount of clothing. But then, when we go to the lake, beach, pool, whatever, up oh, now we've got a completely different standard, and we're basically going to just wear underwear and just sh show everything. Everything. And it's just, we need this kind of preaching more now than we ever have. Because it's just like the line is just, is how much can we push it? So we're just not wearing anything. So, you know, I don't want to prostitute my daughters to be a whore. I don't want hers to, say, right, you know, here, you wear this and just desensitize them to wearing this stuff and show their nakedness. Well, let's continue looking at what is nakedness here. Uh, I had you turn to Exodus, right? Exodus 28. Let me turn there myself. Exodus 28, what else is nakedness? Is it just the thigh? You can, as long as you're not showing the thigh, nothing else, you're good. Well, no, let's look. Because this is even more clear, I think, than Isaiah. He says in verse 41 of Exodus chapter 28, he says, And thou shalt put them, uh, and thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and shall anoint them and consecrate them and sanctify them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. Okay, so he's making them certain types of clothes that's going to cover their nakedness. What is it going to do? How, what he's going to tell us uh, in the next phrase here it says, From the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach. Okay, so we got the thigh in the last verse. If you uncover the thigh, you're uncovering your nakedness. Well, here it's also the loins. 
The loins is the place right above the thighs. They're wearing what's called breeches. We call it britches, which is what I'm wearing now. He said, oh, I, mean, I can't believe you know, this guy's getting up preaching in shorts. You know what? This is what the priests were wearing. But, you know, we, don't, we normally would wear pants. You know, I normally wear pants you know, when I go to church, but you know, it's the camping trip, and I'm wearing breeches, okay? I'm like Aaron, okay? And you know what? But I'm good to go because you know what? My, my thighs are covered. My loins are covered right now. So, you know, my shame's not showing. And you know what? If it's nakedness on me as a man, guess what? It's nakedness on a woman too. Because we never see a verse saying, oh, that's not nakedness on a woman though. A woman, she can just basically just wear a string and that's, she's good. <laughs> you know, it's like, no. We don't, we don't see that at all. You know, even more so women probably should be covered even more. Okay? So, you know, if a harlot is trying to, to advertise herself, she's going to show her body. She's going to uncover the thigh. She's going to show her nakedness. So if we don't want to have an attribute of a whore in this way, we need to make sure our thighs are covered. Where does the thigh start? Let's, it's, well, in this direction, it starts about in this area. The hip bone's connected to the <laughs> leg bone, the thigh bone. And then the thigh bone's connected to the what? The knee. The knee. This is, where, this, is, this is the area of the thigh right here. So, you know, if you get something that's not covering at least unto, unto the thigh, including the thigh, and you got something that's not at least going to the knee, guess what's uncovered? Your nakedness. And guess what that is? A shame. It's a shame. And you know what? I didn't make that up. I did not write these verses. This was written long before I was born. I'm not making this stuff up. Okay? If you don't like this, you have a problem with God. You know, you know what I'm saying? And you know, you might think, well, we're all dressed right now, but you know what? What about when we're not at the church meeting, though? What about when we're hanging out with whoever else that's not in the world? You know, kind of reminds me of what Pastor Shell was talking about. Uh, he talked about, you know, basically the people you get around cause you to act differently. When you go to the church camp meeting and you go to the beach down here, yeah, everything's good. Everyone's covered. Looks good. I think it looks good. Hey, we're all able to swim. Isn't that amazing? Amen. And, you know, I didn't swim because I'm not crazy because that water was cold, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, whatever. Some people are in here from Arizona, and I get it, whatever. You know, different climates. But for me, I'm a, i i got to wait another month. Get a little warmer. But you know what? We were covered. That's, that's crazy, you know. But, okay, but what are we going to do when we're not at the church camp meeting? Different standard now all of a sudden. Well, you know, maybe we need to not be a hypocrite. And, you know, have a standard and have a standard that's based upon God's word, not just a, upon your situation. You know? <clears throat> if it's right at church, it should be right all the time. If, you know, if you're not going to dress this way at church, don't dress that way anywhere else. Okay? All right, moving on. To, the, to verse 11 here. Go back to Proverbs 7. What, are, what is another attribute? We saw one attribute of the attire of a harlot. So if you don't want to be like a whore, you don't want to be like a harlot, don't dress like one. Right? Don't dress like one and you won't have that in common. And you know, by the way, you can have things in common with a harlot you know, that are not identifying you with a harlot. So me and a harlot, we both breathe air. She breathes air, I breathe air. But that doesn't mean that I have something in common with a harlot, as in that, that's making me start to become a harlot. So there are certain things that if you have in common with a harlot or a whore, that's just you being like a whore. That's why God's been telling us this, these things here. He's not just listing random characteristics that don't mean anything. Because when he says the attire of a harlot, that means something. And no, notice what else it says in verse 11. It says that she is loud and stubborn. Loud and stubborn. I don't know about you, but I can't stand seeing this. You know, the, this is like the Karen like person, right? <laughs> Let me talk to your manager, right? right? And this loud, stubborn, got the, you know, Karen haircut and everything, you know. It's just, it's so unbecoming, right? I mean, it's just, man, man just shut up. Just, who cares if your steak wasn't cooked all the way or whatever, whatever I don't know. Just be happy, right? But, you know, okay, so loud and stubborn. Well, well, <clears throat> well what's, the, what's the opposite of that? What are we supposed to do? 
how do we know this even is a, is a bad thing? You know, well, one, it's what the harlot's doing. It's what the woman that looks like a harlot, this strange woman, she's doing this. So that looks pretty bad. Okay. Well, how do we know that this is what we're not supposed to do even more so? You know, if, if you look at um, 1 Peter, go ahead and turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3 in the New Testament. First Peter chapter three. <clears throat> Look at verse one. <clears throat> Likewise, you wives, being subject unto your own husbands, <clears throat> that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. You know what God likes to see? You know, you know more than your makeup and accessories and you know, beautiful hair and the gold you got braided in your hair or whatever, he likes to see the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. That in the sight of God is a great price, the Bible says. Amen. And it says meek and quiet. Because it is not a godly attribute, really for anybody in general, but especially, especially for women to just be you know, characterized as loud. You know, that's more of an attribute that should be reserved for men. Because men are the leaders, men are the ones who have been given authority in general you know, over men, or over women, and they should be the ones that are holding the reins. You know, women shouldn't be getting in the conversation, taking the bull by the horns, and I'm going to take over this conversation. I'm going to overspeak everybody, you know, all the men that are talking. It's like, who are you? Like, can you be quiet? You know, it's, it's just so weird, you know? Like when you're talking, so you and some other guy are talking, and you're already kind of talking, like, you're not whispering, you're talking normal. And then some woman's like, yeah, yeah, you know, you know they, just, they just interrupt, over talk. It's like, hey, that's just like a whore. That ought to go off in our heads. Wow, that's just like a strange woman. That's just like Proverbs 7. We don't want to be like that. We want to be meek and quiet, you know. And that, that's, a, that's in the sight of God a great price. Okay? And... You know, well, when is a good time to exercise quiet? Is, is, is it just that women should just be quiet? You just never speak. We don't want to hear your voice. Just shush. No, no, no. Don't talk. No, obviously not. You know, <laughs> there's a time to, to, to speak and there's a time to keep silence for men and women. Okay? And, well, when is a time, for example, for women to keep silence? Well, I'd say when men are talking in general. But also... We're gonna, we're, we'll see that later in a minute. But, you know, in uh, the Bible, it talks about women keeping silent in the church. Okay? Well, go ahead and turn <clears throat> to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse... Uh, we're going to start at verse 30, 30, 34 here. 1 Corinthians 14, 34. It says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Is this talking about as soon as you show up at church and, and you're inside the building, just quiet game from now on? No, he's talking about if they will learn anything at all, let the master husbands at home. This is talking about while the learning is going on, like right now, for example, you know, men could say, Amen, that's right, or whatever, you know, but women should just be quiet. And if they have a question, well, I don't know about that, I'm not sure, I, do I agree or disagree or whatever, you ask your husbands at home. That's what he just said. I didn't say it. God said that. Amen. Okay. Well, is this the only place this is, this, is, this is seen here? No. 
Just in case you didn't get it the first time, maybe you didn't read the Bible, or maybe you didn't read the, the, all the Bible, he gives it again. You know, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, go ahead and turn over there. We don't want to be loud and stubborn. We don't want to have the attribute of a whore of just a loud woman. And you know what? When a woman is saying, Amen, Pastor, in church, <laughs> that's the attribute of a whore out there. You know, whether or not what she's agreeing with is right or not, you know what? You, you uttering your voice there, you're just like the loud and stubborn woman who doesn't have enough sense to be quiet, to know when to be quiet. You know, there's a time when I need to be quiet. And I need to have sense to know when to be quiet. So, you know, don't take it personally. There's a time and a place for everything for all of us. But guess what? There's a difference between men and women. And there's differences in times of when women and when men should be quiet. And one of those times the Bible spells out, I'm not spelling it out, the Bible's spelling it out for us, when women should be quiet in church. If they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. Amen. And men, I don't understand, you know, you go to a church and a woman's saying amen, and their husband's right there, and you're just thinking to yourself like, what are you doing? Tell her to shut up. Really? I mean, come on now. Read the Bible. Why don't you lead your marriage? Why don't you lead your family? Why don't you do what the Bible's telling us to do? Okay, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. It says, let the woman learn in silence. Again, when is, this, when is this supposed to be happening? During the learning, okay? With all subjection. <clears throat> but I suffer not a woman to teach, she says, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Okay? And we saw loud and stubborn the Bible says women should keep silence in the church with all subjection. Because, you know, and, and we're not to, not to usurp authority over the man. Women should never be in any position, inside or outside of the church, where they're over a man. Whether it be in a conversation, where you're having a conversation and then a woman's like, oh yeah, you know, and she just takes over the conversation. And now you can't get a, a word in edgewise because it's just like being dictated by some loudmouth, stubborn woman. Or in any other situation, whether it be in the White House or the Whore House, we should call it now, right, with Kamala Harris or whatever, or at work, you know, the, every female boss, you know, she has a, a characteristic of a whore because she's usurping authority over a man. And, you know, it's the op I'd say it's the opposite of stubbornness because God's telling you to be in subjection and you're basically being stubborn, and you're going to go ahead and usurp authority anyways. Right? <clears throat> so, you know, the, the strange woman, she's loud. The godly woman that's inside of God, a great, you know, uh, that has that ornament of a meek and quiet spirit that's inside of God a great price, you know, she's quiet, loud, quiet. If you don't want your daughters or your wives to be like a whore, Make sure they're quiet when they need to be, right? Don't let them be loud when they're not supposed to be, okay? You know, in general, we should not just be characterized as just these loud, stubborn men either. Loudness and stubbornness in general, it's not, it's not a virtue, right? You know, but especially for women, because women should be characterized with this attribute of being meek and quiet, even more so. Okay, go ahead. Let's go ahead and look at... Uh, the second part of verse 11 here in Proverbs chapter 7 says she is loud and stubborn. And then it says, Her feet abide not in her house. What does abide mean? It means it's, it's not, it stays not. Her feet stay not. She's, she's not at home. So a whore, guess where she's not? Her, a whore is not at home. Where's she at? Anywhere else. She's out in the streets, it says in the next verse. Now she without, now in the streets. So another attribute of a whore is you're not at home. You know, you're not, you're out everywhere else. You, have, you got your job as a woman. You know, you're at, you got your, you're going to college. You're getting your degree or whatever. You know what, the, this is an attribute of a whore. Because a whore, she's not staying home, and you're not either. I didn't make that up. It just, why, is he, why is he saying... Hey, by the way, her feet abide not in her house. If that doesn't matter. 
if he doesn't want us to know that? Well, if that's not significant, I think it matters. Why I think it matters? Well, you know what? The Bible says that women are supposed to keep home, keep the home, and to guide the house while you're there. You know, well, I gotta, I gotta have a job. I gotta go out and work. You know, what am I supposed to do with myself? Well, God tells us what to do. Go ahead and turn uh, to First Timothy. So I just want to know the will of God for my life. You know, you hear this all the time, right? Women will say, I just want to know what the will of God is for my life. I'm trying to pick the right career. Does He want me to major in this? Does He want me to get this job? You're asking the wrong question. You need to read the Bible. What is God's will for a young lady? You know, it says in 1 Timothy... Okay, yeah, 1 Timothy chapter 5... We're going to start reading in verse 11. <clears throat> so in this chapter, he's given basically the qualifications of what it takes for a church to financially provide for a widow. And one of the qualifications is they have to be a certain age. They have to be at least 60 years old. And they have to do other things. But there's sometimes, you know, sometimes people become widows, kind of like Tamar, right? And we don't know her age necessarily, but... She, that's younger than that, that's younger than 60. You know, what does it say here? But the younger widows refuse. So don't, you know, don't financially take care of and provide for, you know, the younger widows because he says refuse them. Well, okay, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house. And not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. So they need something to keep them busy. You know, I've got to have my job. I've got I mean, I to do something. Well, so what am I going to do? Well, what does God want us to do? I will therefore, so for the reason that women are idle and they're, they're tattlers and they're not married here, because of that, this is what I want. This is the will of God for a young lady's life. I will therefore that the younger women marry bear children, guide the house. Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. Because when you're not busy and you're getting into all this sin, the devil's going to accuse you. He's the accuser of the brethren. okay? And he's going to bring against you. You're giving him an occasion to, to our adversary, the devil, to speak against us and to avoid you know, turning aside after Satan in this way, you marry, bear children, guide the house. And guess what? If your feet are not abiding in your house like the whore, you're not guiding your house. If you're not there, you can't do it. Well, that's just an isolated verse. That's the only, that's the only time it says that. No. Titus chapter 2. Just in case you didn't get it that time. Titus chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 1, just a few pages over. It says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. So you know, Paul is telling Titus, hey, when you're teaching your congregation, when you're teaching the aged women, the older women, that you should be telling them that they should be teaching the younger women good things. What are those good things? He tells us in the next verse. He starts to tell us that they may teach. So this is the good things that, that, he, that he's instructing for the elder women to teach the younger women. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children... Can't do it if you don't have them, by the way. So, you know, we should be trying to have children, right? And then it says, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. Keepers at home. The opposite of your feet not abiding at your home. So, if you don't want to have this attribute of a whore, then stay home, women. You know, the world's not, see, the world's not going to tell you. That. Why preach this? You're not going to hear it anywhere else. No one's going to tell you this. The world's going to tell you, you don't need a man. You need to go get your career, go to college, get your degree. So that way, if you get married, when you get married, you might have one kid or whatever. Then, you know, you got your backup plan. You, can, you know, you, you, can, you got your escape route. You know, that way you're not stuck. You're not trapped in that marriage because that would be horrible, right? No, actually, that, that would be God's will. 
obviously, you know, you don't want to be in a marriage where you feel that way, but, you know, it'd be better to, feel, to be stuck in a marriage and be right with God, at least, in that aspect, than to be, you know, committing adultery. Because under God's law, that was, commit, that was punished by the death penalty. So would you rather just be stuck with your wife or die? Because that's your options, according to God. And hopefully you wouldn't rather die. Hopefully it's not that bad, right? You know? But uh, keepers at home, it says. So no college. You know, and, you know, women that go to college, you know, you know, this is for the fathers too, you know, if, if you send your daughter, you let your daughter go to college, you're an idiot. Don't you care about your daughter? Don't you want your daughter to be virgin and to be pure? How are you going to be able to guarantee at all that she's going to be, oh, she's going to make the right choice. I'm sure she's, we raised her right. Okay, what if she makes the right choice, but someone forces her? Well, you raised her right, but you weren't there to protect her. So now what? Because you know what? God's method, God's plan was a, a woman, a lady, a young girl is with her father, and then she, he gives her away on her wedding day. That's why when we saw with Tamar, when she became a widow, she didn't have a husband to take care of her anymore, to provide for her and to protect her anymore. Where did she go? What did the Bible say then? She went back where? To her father's house. That's just a coincidence. I'm sure that the Bible mentioned that. She goes to her father's house because you know what? If your daughter is not a virgin on our wedding day, dads, it's your fault. Your fault. That's what the Bible teaches. Go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy 22. Well, I did everything I could. And I raised her right. You know, I told her, you know, whatever. And she just was a whore anyways. We, you know, we, we did our part. No, that's not, is that what the Bible teaches? Let's look and see what the Bible teaches. Deuteronomy 22, verse 13. <clears throat> if any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her and give occasions of speech against her, and bring up an evil name upon her, and say, I took this woman, and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. And by the way, a maid, it means a virgin. And that's why, by the way, that's why they call it maiden name. Because it's supposed to be the name you had when you were still a virgin. Not when you were just unmarried. Because when you're unmarried, you should be a virgin. You know, unless you're a widow, of course. Right? So she was a maid, when she was, she was still a virgin. He's saying, no, this woman wasn't a maid. I married this woman, but she wasn't a maid. She wasn't a virgin. You know, so this is why he, he's, he's finding an occasion to speech against her. Because you're like, I, th I thought this woman was a virgin. I married her, thinking that, going into this. Turns out she's not a maid at all. She's not a virgin at all. So now, what's he, what's he want to do? It says, Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter. By the way, it says, you know, the dad says, I gave my daughter. He didn't say, her mother and I give her away. I know, I've been to weddings before and, and was like, who gives this woman away? Her mother and I. No, I give my daughter away. That's what you should say. That's what it says in the Bible. Not her mother and I. You weakling. I give her away. I give this woman away. Okay? I gave my daughter unto this man's wife. And he hateth her. And lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid. And yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. See how a maid means it, she's virgin? And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city, and the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him. So basically they have some kind of way to figure out that she actually is a virgin. She actually was a maid. He was lying. He was just trying to look a way out of this marriage. Okay? And when that happens, they're going to chastise him. They're going to beat him for basically coming up with this railing accusation against her and hating her without a cause. And what's going to happen next? And they shall immerse him in an hundred shekels of silver and give them unto the maid, the mother, the father. The father. Why? Why, why is the father getting paid? Because... He's the one that's supposed to be guaranteeing, hey, I gave my daughter. She was a virgin. She was a maid. I made sure of it. But then, this guy's lying. He's saying, I'm a liar. He's saying, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. He's saying, 
that she's not a maid. And then they find out, oh, well, he's lying. We're going to beat him and he's going to pay you. Because he brought up, uh, he was making you look bad. By basically saying, you didn't do what you were supposed to do. Right? right. That's what the Bible's teaching. So guess what? You know, if, you know if, if, your, if your daughter is not virgin on her wedding day, it's your fault, Dad. Your fault. Okay? Right. You are responsible. It's not only your fault. It's also your mother, you know, the mother's fault. It's also the daughter's fault. Right? But you know what? Especially the father. You know, dads ought to be able to guarantee that their daughters are virgin. You know, because you're there making sure that nothing's happening. You're keeping things accountable. Okay? She's not going off to college where you don't know what's going on. Hopefully she's obeying the, the, the Christian, you know, college rules and she's staying on campus or whatever. It's like, I hope, you know, hopefully, you know, no, you guarantee. You guarantee. That's why you do it. Okay, that's what the Bible teaches there. You know, you don't go to college. Look at Dinah. Read the Bible. Can you handle at least going through Genesis? No one never knows about Dinah. Dinah is, you know, she's a cautionary tale. You know, she's, you know, she's like a, she's a byword in my mind. Don't be like Dinah. Don't, let, don't be like Jacob in that situation either. You know, obviously Jacob was a godly example in general, but not when it comes to raising his daughter. Because he let her, what did it say about her? I'm not going to turn there, but it said he let her daughter go see the daughters of the land. And what happened? She was defiled. She wasn't raped. She, she wasn't forced. Okay? She was defiled because he wasn't there. And who, 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 who had the consequences from that? More than anyone else. Jacob. Because, you know, if you know the story, you know, Levi and uh, uh, Simeon, they basically go and just kill everybody that was involved, you know, that, that was of the people that, you know, of the, the guy where he was from, he killed him and everyone that lived around him, basically, right? Because of the fact that they defiled his daughter. They treated her like a harlot, is what they said, basically. That he dealt with her as a harlot or as a whore. And, uh, you know, and what was Jacob's response? You know, basically now I'm in like this danger. You know, he's thinking like they're going to try and kill me now. Well, if you'd have taken care of things in the first place, this never would have happened. Your sons would not have taken this upon themselves, even though what they did was not right, and, and try to take justice, you know, that, that is, you know, that's a cautionary tale. It's what, you know, we don't want to be on the other side of that story, where that happens to our daughter, and we're just like, oh, you know, man, I mean, what a shame. That hurts. I mean, that would, that would break my heart. It ought to break all of our hearts, Okay. So, you know, this preaching, you know, oh, why can't I go and have fun? You know, I want to go to college. I want to do this. Or I, want to, I want to get my job, you know, whatever, as a woman. You know what? When you go and you have your job, guess what happens all the time at the workplace? Adultery. Yeah. Adultery, adultery, everywhere you go. You know, just this last week, I'm hearing about a woman, you know, at my work, and I don't even know who she is. I never met her. She got fired or whatever. You know, and she's married. Her husband works somewhere else in, in the same place. It's a big place. And she's having sex with like all these guys on the line, you know, on, on, on the workplace, just different ones. And then she gets fired. It's like, what in the world? But there's no, cor but there's no correlation between, you know, women committing adultery and women being at the workplace, though. There's no correlation there, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, right. You know, if, 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 when you're around other men for eight hours a day, five days a week, don't you think you're creating an opportunity for adultery there? Don't you think we ought not to make provision for the flesh? You know, you're having a rough marriage or whatever, you got problems, and then you go to work, and instead of working it out amongst your husband or your wife like you should, you just complain about them to someone else at work, and then, oh, well, so and so, they really understand. It's so, it's so nice to talk. Oh, they have problems in their marriage too. This is how adultery happens. You know what? The woman in, the, in Proverbs 7. It says she had the attire of a harlot, but she was actually, I think she was a married woman committing adultery. Where do I get that from? Look at verse, go ahead and go back to Proverbs verse seven, uh, in chapter 7 there where we are. And look at verse 16. We're going to read through 20 where she's saying to this guy, I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. 
I perfume my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Then you're out of there, by the way. Let us solace ourselves with love. We're going to comfort ourselves. It's going to be great. One night. One night I'm yours. Not for, or why for a night? Why? For the good man is not at home. He has gone a long journey. So we can, we can have this one night of love because my husband, or you know, maybe her father, I think it's her husband, because of the fact that we read about this adulterous woman. We just read about her in the, in the chapter before. We didn't read it, but it's in Proverbs 6. talks about, you know, um, Whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding, he that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. And wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. For jealousy is the rage of a man, therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. Neither will he, re neither will he regard any ransom. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. You know, if you get caught in, in, in the act of adultery and the husband's there, you're probably going to be killed. And he's not going to listen to any bribe or anything you have to offer. You're probably, you know, you might die. So that's why if you do it, you lack understanding. You're a fool. But this woman, she said, hey, don't worry. Goodman's not here. Goodman's gone a long, far journey. He's taken a bag of money with him. He's, you know, he's got to spend all that before he gets back. It's a long trip. Don't worry. We can do it one night. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. He's not even coming back until like a month from now. He'll never find out. So you don't have to worry about him coming in and killing you. Right? This is an adulterous woman. Right? She's probably a married woman wearing the entire of an harlot, just going out, not staying home, going out at the workplace, going down at the office, and she's committing adultery. We live in a land that's fallen to whoredom because this happens all the time. Why preach this sermon? You know, because this happens all the time. Does it not? All right. The next attribute I'm going to cover, look at verse 12. So we saw, you know, we don't want to have the attire of an harlot. We don't want to be loud and stubborn. We want our feet to abide at our household for, for our ladies. And if we are ladies, we want, to, we want to exhibit these godly attributes and do basically just do the opposite of what this woman's doing, which is what we're really learning. Uh, look at verse 12. It continues saying, And now is she without now in the streets. So, you know, she, she's, she's not staying home. It's still on that thought. And look what it says next. It says, And life and wait at every corner. Now, one woman cannot lie in wait at every single corner. That's impossible. What is, what is he saying here? Well, it's probably saying that she gets around a lot. She's probably got a lot of setups, right? But that's still not every corner. I think what he's saying is that there's, there's a lot of these kind of women. This type of woman is just a, di you know, a dime a dozen, right? You know, you don't have to look far. Before, you know, she's the exact opposite of the virtuous woman. The virtuous woman, you know, her price is, you know, far above rubies. It's really hard to find her. It's a rare find. But the whore here, you just take a couple of steps and she's probably on that corner. Right. You know? That's good. Every corner is what the Bible says. Okay? Because guess what? What I'm telling you right now, if you're looking for someone to disagree with me, you're going to you're gonna easily find it. Yep. Because... I am in the minority because the majority is on every corner and they're all showing their thighs. They're all going to work. They're all not abiding at their house. They're all showing their butt. They're going to these different places. They're doing all this stuff. They're going to say, oh, he's crazy. You know, you don't have to listen to him. We're all doing it. Everyone else is doing it. We, all, we lie away in every corner. If you want to find an occasion to disagree with what the Bible is teaching here, you're not going to have to look far at all. It's, it's the majority view that's going to disagree. Okay, so you can take your comfort in your, in your numbers if that's what you want. It's not going to be hard. Okay, verse 13 says, So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me, this day have I paid my vows. I want to look at that word there where it says, impudent she said unto him, she, she caught him. She just comes up to this guy. She grabs him, doesn't even know him. And she catches him, just grabs him, and she kisses him. Never met him. She says, and she's doing this with an impudent face. And then she proceeds to say what she says in the next verse. But she's doing it with an impudent face. What does that word impudent mean? Well, Webster Dictionary, 1828.com, impudent means shameless wanting or lacking modesty 
bold with contempt of others. Because guess what? This woman, when she's taking this man, she hates him. She has contempt for him. She's, she's subtle of heart. She's, she's crafty. She's doing something because she's, she's got a plan. She's trying to make money. She's trying to do whatever, right? She's doing something evil to him. And she has, she has no shame. Impudent face means she is shameless. She does not have shame facedness like the Bible teaches we should have. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. We were there earlier. We're going to look at some more of the scripture that we didn't read the first time we were there. So the whore here, an attribute of the whore, is she has an impudent face. She has no shame. She, she is shameless. She's just able to do things doesn't bother her. Doesn't make her flinch. Okay, well, let's look and see what, what does the Bible say that we should be like? What does the Bible say that young ladies or women should be like? 1 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 8. He says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shame, facedness, and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but that but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. You know, again, that ornament of good works, the ornament of meek and quiet spirit that's in the sight of God a great price. Don't worry about all the flashiness. Have that, have that character. Because that's hard to find. That's the virtuous woman. That's hard to find. But here he mentions here that this the you know that we should that she should have shame facedness. It should make her embarrassed to do certain things or to show certain parts of herself, right? She should, be wanna, she should wanna be in the background. That's why the women would cover their face. Even Tamar had enough shamefacedness to cover her face. Because even, you know, the culture, you know, you know was a little different. You know, even though she was basically being a harlot, that's how, that's how you know, Judah knew that she was a harlot. Because she's just out, she's not in her father's house. You know, she's just out in some corner, it said. And she's got her face wrapped up so no one knows who she is. Why? Because she's, being, she's playing the harlot. She's playing the whore. She doesn't want her identity to be out there. Because she has enough shamefacedness. Right? Because the harlot, but, but the harlot in Proverbs, I mean, she's just basically like, she's just completely impudent, no shame. You know, the Bible talks about, well, hey, you know, before I get there, so... The opposite of the shamefacedness is the impudent face, not, not having any shame. So this would be like someone telling you, hey, if you show your thigh, that's a shame. The Bible says that's a shame. You're showing your shame. And you said, well, I don't think it's a shame. I don't feel ashamed. Well, that's you being like the harlot. That's you being like the whore. You have an attribute of a whore. You don't, you don't have enough shame. You need to get some shame. You need to have some shamefacedness. It needs to embarrass you. You ought not to be so desensitized from these things to what doesn't bother you. It ought to bother you. That's what it means to have shamefacedness. It bothers you. Oh, man, you know, it embarrasses you. It ought to embarrass you. And, you know, and we train our girls from early. You know, we get them in their skimpy little bathing suits from, like, as soon as they're born. And, oh, look how cute their little miniskirt looks. No, it doesn't look cute. You're training them to be a harlot. You're training them to be a whore one day. Why don't we train our daughters to be godly? and to cover their nakedness, and don't get them used to just showing it all to the world. Amen? Amen. Okay? We don't want to have a whore's forehead. Okay? Look at Jeremiah chapter 3. If you want to turn there, you can. I'm going to get there myself. Jeremiah chapter 3. Talking about attributes of a whore, we're going to look at what the Bible describes as a whore's forehead. What does it mean to have a whore's forehead? I've never heard that term before, maybe you might think. Okay. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 1. They say, If a man put away his wife, and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? I think I, think I misread that. I'm sorry. Let me start that verse over. They, said, they say, if a, if a man put away his wife, and she go from him and become another man's, Shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. So this is God preaching against the nation of Judah. They're going after all these false gods. They're, 
he's comparing and likening unto them to a woman who's playing the harlot against her husband. But he's saying, you know what? Even, you know, even though if, if actual marriage happened where, where he put her away, they wouldn't get back together. But now he's saying, I want you to come back to me again. He's saying, using that object lesson or that comparison there. He says, lift up thine eyes unto the high places and see where thou hast not been lying with. In the ways hast thou sat for them as the Arabian in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain, and thou hadst a whore's forehead. What, is that? what does that mean, though, to have a whore's forehead? Look at the next phrase. Thou refusest to be ashamed. A whore's forehead is a, is a forehead. It's not talking about that she's got a unibrow or she's got too much powder or something on her forehead or she's got a bad hairline or something. Too many wrinkles. It's talking about the fact that she refused, she refuses to be ashamed. She knows she ought to be ashamed. The preacher told her she should be ashamed to show her thigh. The preacher told her she should be ashamed to not abide in her house. But she said, no, I'm going to work anyways. I'm wearing my short shorts anyways. I refuse to be ashamed. Whoa. You, you, you have a whore's forehead. You know, you have a stiff neck. You know, and you, know, you, ought, you better be careful because the Bible puts some pretty strong warnings on those that refuse to be corrected and they harden themselves that way. You better watch out. You know, he that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. You, know, you better be careful refusing to be ashamed when God's telling you you ought to be ashamed. Why don't we have a tender heart to God's Word? Why do we need to fight God's Word. You know, God loves us. He's trying to help us. His commandments are not grievous to us. He's doing this for our good. You know, if you love someone, you, won't, you don't want them to be doing something that's embarrassing. You know, if I got something on my face right now, and I got, you know, a big old bug hanging out my nose or whatever, you know, I'd like, hey, can you take that off? If you love somebody, you'd tell me about it, right? You wouldn't just let me stand up here the whole time preaching like that, would you? Right? No. You know, you know, and if you love somebody, you can tell them if, if they're doing something that's embarrassing, you're going to tell them about it. And this is what God, this is the whole point of the sermon, this is what God's trying to tell us. You know, so the woman that has no shame, she, she has no shame. It doesn't bother her to usurp authority over the man. She can go, she can just start usurping authority over men. You know, Kamala Harris has no shame. She has no shame when, when she's, you know, the, the second, you know, in command basically or whatever, right? Vice president. Female ball. She has no shame when she's committing, you know, whoredom to get to the job in the first place, right? The female boss has no shame. She, she ha they, the, all these different areas that you see women in, they have this attribute of an impudent face, like the horse woman. They have this attribute of a whore. Okay? Go back to Proverbs. We're going to wrap it up here soon. You say, well, I'm not like that. Look, we're going to look at verse 14. I'm not like that at all. You know, I go to church. I'm a godly woman, you know, or whatever. More. Or my daughters, my wife, they go to church. They're godly women, you know. Uh, okay. Well, look at verse 14. Look, look, look what that woman says. I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. What's this, what does this have to do with? This is, this is stuff that has to do with religion. She's, she's, paid, she's, she's making vows to God. She's got her peace offerings. She's a religious woman. She goes to church. This is a woman you're going to find at church. When her husband's in town, and she's going to church, I guess, right? She just got done paying her vow. You know, she's just, oh, she's so godly. You know, she's at church. Don't think that just because you're raising your daughters in church that that's all you have to do, that they're good. That, oh, this isn't her because, you know, I got my daughter in church or I got my wife in church or, oh, I'm going to church, so this isn't me. Well, you know what? Beware. You know what? You know, we need to take heed to these negative attributes that we see of this whore's wife. We need, we need to not dress like a harlot. You know, what a shame for God to look down on us and say, man, that woman right there, she's dressed like a harlot. She has the clothes of a harlot right now. Because that is, I mean, that's so dumb because it's so easy to not be that way. You know, certain sins are harder than others. It's real easy to just get a, a little bit more fabric. Real easy. I mean, it's not what, you know, I would hate God to think something like that about me. Let's not have the attire of an harlot. You know, let's not be loud and stubborn. Let's know when to be silent. Let's know, let's know our places. Let's, you know, let's, let, let's not let our women go off to work or college or whatever. Let's have their feet abide at home and keep the home. 
Let's have some shame about our head. Or, you know, let's have some shamefacedness. Let's, let's be ashamed of things we ought to be ashamed of. Okay, if God says it's a shame, let's be ashamed. If you're not ashamed, get ashamed. Okay, pray that God will change your heart. If you're that desensitized to it and you cannot blush, like the Bible talks about, pray that God will tender your heart. Okay, let's not have, let, let's have godly attributes. Let's not have attributes of a whore. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to preach, Lord. I pray that this was a blessing uh, to, to someone here, and I thank you for all the people that came out in this great uh, church camp meeting we had. I uh, pray that you would just bless us as we go our separate ways. Bless all the uh, people that are still having flights out of here and, and, and people that have long, long drives. And pray that we'd all have just safety on the roads. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen.